Hello, everybody. This is Cynthia Allen, and really glad to have you. Yes, thank you, Mary. This is my Darby tie. You know, you all let know that I'm crazy. Those of you who know me, crazy me about my dog Darby, the Woodle. And well, we wanted ties for that video that we did of Darby pretending to be Larry or I, because Larry wears ties, and you have to buy them. You can't buy like a single dog tie. They like sell them in like packages of 36. I've been trying to figure out how to make use of the ties. I'm feeling like this gives me a whole new look, just adding a tie. So I'm excited, I'm excited to try it out today. Um, so we've got people here coming in that know us and the work, but for sure we have people here that this is their first interaction with us. So why don't you just put in the, in the, comments if you are new to us or the Feldenkrais method or if you are experienced and experience doesn't mean you're a practitioner it just means you know what? I got the lay of the land I know how it I know how this works right off the bat I need to say who I am though because if you're new you really don't have any idea who I am so I'm Cynthia Allen I am a partner in future life now and that's who hosts the Feldenkrais Awareness Summit, as well as your learning body of Feldenkrais uh, community. Actually, the summit is called Move Better, Feel Better. Sorry, it used to be called Feldenkrais Awareness, but we call it Move Better, Feel Better Summit. And quite a few of you are signed up for that summit. And if you are signed up, can you put that in the chat for us? And if you're not signed up, ask for the link and Katrina is going to pop it right in there for you so you can get signed up because it's free. You might as well do it. And um, so I've been a Feldenkrais practitioner and uh, in healthcare management and uh, movement intelligence uh, trainer for a number of years now. Got quite a few uh, decades under my belt in helping people in some way or another. And I'm passionate about people having more options about how to recover from injury, prevent injury, uh, live in a way that's not organized around chronic pain, that gives people joy and pleasure. And I believe that all that is possible. I've experienced that all that is possible. So really glad to have you and give you this experience today. So I wanna begin by bringing us to some understanding or basic understanding, maybe pretty rudimentary, but I think important for this lesson to be fresh, new, and give you some new information to some of these ball and socket joints that we have. So we have, you could take your left hand, for example, and you could feel into your right shoulder and you could come up to the top of the right shoulder and you could kind of feel this little pointy aspect of the shoulder joint. And then you might be able to feel right in front of it. Oh, hey, there is the ball that goes with the humerus, my upper arm bone, my upper arm bone. So you've got this acromion here and then you've got this ball. And so this ball is what I'm gonna be having you see if you can start to organize some of your thoughts around the way this ball rolls in the socket. If you extend your arm out and then you just roll the arm in and out, you can kind of feel like, oh yeah, that ball rolls in the socket. And it can roll in the socket somewhat um, independent of the shoulder blade of that little knotty point up there, right? At some point, the whole thing moves. At some point, if you keep going in either extreme direction, but it can actually move somewhat separately. Now, <clears throat> you can go ahead and let that go. And then you can bring your other hand up to the opposite shoulder. You can kind of feel the top of your humerus, your upper arm bone, kind of slide up there until you find that pointy aspect, right? The acromion process there. And then you kind of slide down underneath it. And you start to feel, oh, oh, there's a there's a rounded shape there. Now, some of us have a lot of musculature here. We're in really great shape. And so you may not feel the boniness as clearly as somebody who doesn't have as much tissue there. So a bodybuilder might feel more of the muscle, but often you can still even tell, oh, there's some kind of shift in the shape and the topography of the area. 
and uh, and maybe even something about the texture uh, underneath it. Now, if we look at the skeleton who is also sporting a Derby tie, this was a close runner up for me, close runner up. Um, <clears throat> this is the little, this is that little knotty pointy place that you've been feeling in yourself, right? The acromion process. And here's the ball. Here's the ball in the socket. Here's the ball in the socket, okay? So of course the ball can again rotate a little bit, but then it's not gonna be much before you're gonna see some movement here in the collarbone and in the shoulder blade behind. Mm -hmm. Okay, <clears throat> now we have these two shoulder joints, these two balls, in the socket. You're going to hear me talk a lot about the ball in the socket. You'll hear me kind of shortcut it and probably say the shoulder ball um, or the upper arm ball, but I'm talking about the ball in the socket. And we could connect this in this direction across our cells with an imaginary line, one ball in the socket to the other. For those of you who are more experienced, I would invite you to think about connecting through the interior of the ball where we can't even see in the inside. But for those of us with less experience, we're probably gonna think about the outside of it, okay? So practitioners think a little bit about the inside just for the heck of it. Maybe those of you with less experience think just about the, and I'm thinking about a line of light. I'm not thinking about something fixed or hard or, charcoal penciled in. I'm thinking about an imaginary line of light that connects these two. And of course, if there's a line of light, it could continue left and right, right? It doesn't have to just stop here. Hmm. Okay. Now we're going to come down here to this lovely little, oh, there is a really good view of that tie now, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Now we're down to the pelvis. Okay. And people often call this the hips the hip, the hips, but really there's a lot of architecture in here and it's very confusing to me that people call it hips because so many people think of their hip as just one location off in the top of the waist. So I'm gonna talk about it as the pelvis and I'm gonna talk about this ball in the socket that belongs to the hip, that belongs to the hip. Now I want you to really notice here, this is the pubic bone just notice in this little skeletal model, which is average, it's average, it's not, everybody's gonna be different, but notice that the distance, the width in the pubic bone, I'm trying to see if I can get you a better view of that. The width, the width of the pubic bone, look at that pubic bone, and then look at how close the interior of the ball sits to that pubic bone. Whoa, like who knew that? Look at how, look at how narrow that space is where our hip joints actually are. So let's see if we can find those on ourselves for a moment, clarify that. So you might be able to do it fine in sitting. You might want to stand, that's up to you. But you can find your own pubic bone, okay? And you can, if you, as long as you're comfortable with it, you, you don't want to find your pubic bones, okay. You're not being recorded. And you, if you want to turn your camera off for a minute, you can. But you can find like the top of your pubic bone. And then you can probably find the sides of your pubic bone. And man, it turns out that those hip joints are nestled really quite close. Really quite close. Hmm. How close then? They're in the groin line. Okay. And you lift one leg, perhaps. You can definitely do this in sitting if you are unable to stand, you can lift that and you can go, oh, wow. So it's back there somewhere, it's back in there somewhere. And then when you lie on the floor in a little bit, you'll be able to feel with the muscular stretched out a little bit more, what might be the shape of the ball, the outside shape of the ball. It'll be different because it is really encased in uh, musculature to protect it, right? 
it's much more encased than the shoulder joint is. It's really deeply embedded in there. So where we can really get a clear feeling here, wow, there's the ball. You will not feel the ball like that inside your pelvis, but you'll feel the thickness of the covering that's protecting it and holding it in place. And you will be able to kind of maybe go, that might be the curve of it, might be. So again, we could then in our imagination, we could have a, a beam of light that connects these balls in the socket. Again, for the more experienced, you might be able to think about it from the interior ball to socket, ball, ball. But for those of us who are, this idea is completely new, you know, you might struggle around with it. So make it as easy as you possibly can for yourself. Okay. So we have this horizontal line that we're going to be working with, another horizontal line. But we're also going to be working with a light line that comes down. Light line that comes down. Light line that comes down. And we're going to be working with one that goes on the diagonal. On the diagonal. Ah. That's a little odd. So I'm going to show you a, a picture to share my screen quickly with a picture of how I kind of imagine this in a very rudimentary kind of way. And I unfortunately had to draw this because like there was nobody that had out there what I was kind of looking for. And that was the now. So if this is the shoulders here up here across the top. And this is the pelvis across the bottom. We kind of have these four lines. Well, actually, that six line, six line. We've got the top going horizontal, the bottom horizontal. We've got the uh, vertical line, which isn't really vertical, right? This is a trapezoid because the hip joints are a little narrower than the shoulders. And then we have these diagonal lines that we're going to be playing with. Now, I promised you that this is going to be helpful to you in relaxation, but also in your ease and standing and walking. So you might be thinking, what in the world? This seems awfully theoretical, but I think it's a nice place for us to start. And then I said it was going to be about connecting our collective and um individual so the picture that i just had shown you before that's your individual you can see that these lines can continue right they can continue and this is an alex gray photo that i just grabbed from the internet inappropriately for today and if, if you've never looked at alex gray's work thought about purchasing alex gray's work my gosh it's just phenomenal phenomenal and we see here this grid, right? This grid, it's curved, it's not exact, but this one of these little units could be you. And one of these little units could be me. And one of these little units could be your best friend. And one of these little units could be Katrina from our team it's helping in the background. One of these little units could be Arlene. One of these little units could be the speaker. So uh, I will be guiding you to begin to start with yourself. And hopefully we will reach a place where we'll feel not only the connections in ourselves, but we'll feel the connections to each other, right? Now we have with us today two people who are going to demo this work for you. This work is really subtle. This lesson's really subtle. So you may wonder, what the heck? They're hardly moving. But I do just want to introduce them to you real quick. Pia, 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 Pia. We're just wait. There she is. And some of you maybe are not able to lie down. You couldn't do this on your bed. It, there's always like these caveats. Is it better on the floor? Well, yeah, it is better on the floor on a mat if you can be relatively comfortable there and you can get up and down safely. Then you could do it on a bed. Squishier, maybe not gonna be quite as good of feedback for you. 
You could do this in a recliner. And then if you really need to be sitting up for some reason, like this P is going to make adaptations. I'm gonna teach it as if the entire thing is in the lying down position. And Pia is going to interpret them within this sitting position. So if you get confused, you feel like you wanna see what's going on, you can just wait until Pia's picture pops up on the screen and watch what she's doing. But I also just encourage you that it doesn't matter whether you're doing it right. It only matters that you listen, take care of yourself, and you let your brain try to figure it out. That's the learning is letting your brain kind of figure it out much more than trying to copy. But if you start to, start to feel frustrated or like this doesn't seem right, I seems like I'm hurting myself. Well, we don't want that. Take a look. Now we also have with us Marlena. And Marlena is going to be lying on the floor for us. Hey, Marlena, can you go ahead and go down to the floor, please? So those of you who are going to lie in bed or on the floor, this lesson is mostly taught with your legs long. So there's a couple of things that Marlena has set up for herself. One, she's checking to see if she needs any padding underneath her head. And I suggested a couple of folded face or hand towels. We don't really want our head hanging back. We don't need to have our head supported more than what would bring it in line with the spine. And for Marlena, those two towels actually brought her head up more than uh, in more than it would be in alignment, brought it forward of her spine. So if she would put one of those, both of those back under, we can see what that's like again. You can see how her chin now gets pushed towards her chest and kind of closes off her throat. We usually don't want that. But some of you are really going to need it just to come to level. So if she goes ahead and removes them again, her forehead here is a little higher than her chin. Then we can see she's quite level here. Now, there are others of you that say, I cannot lie without a pillow under my head. I get dizzy. I have other kinds of vestibular problems. I'm scared for my neck. Well, then you do what you need to do for sure. We're not, uh, we don't want to ever override what it is that you need to do, okay? Good, then, thank you for po posting Alex Gray. Thank you for that. So Marlena has got pillows. If you don't, you feel like you might be able to lie with your legs long, if you had support under your knees, you can have a rolled up towel, you can have a big pillow, you could stack two pillows. And if you still find that you can't lie that way, now, I'm not recommending that you, any of you try to sit up this frontal way that she's doing because you have to be really well organized not to hurt your neck. Um, but she's trying to get through it for us in terms of our timing, I can see. If that still doesn't work for you, then you bring your feet to the standing position with the knees towards the ceiling. We call it feet in standing because when you get your feet in the just right position, it feels like the weight of your foot, is the weight of your leg is standing on your foot and your feet won't slide away from you and you don't have to fight them. Want to do one last thing then with uh, uh, Pia. And Pia has a pillow that you she can use. So we're going to ask you to, to sit in a way that's comfortable for you, but more or less upright. And this lesson, it would be fine for you to sit back and lean on something. You don't have to stay at the front of your chair the whole time, like we do in some Feldenkrais lessons. You just wanna find a way to be fairly comfortable and you could absolutely have a pillow there if you needed it, okay? So go ahead and come up to stand if you're able to stand and just take a moment to walk around. Just feel for yourself, walk around, feel what walking is like for you right now, feel what standing is like for you right now. You don't need to see anything because you're just paying attention to yourself, right? And don't just walk in place, walk a few feet, turn around, walk a few feet back. And you're curious, you know, how comfortable is standing for you right now? How, how easy is walking for you? Does it feel like your legs are light or heavy? 
do you find that one leg comes off the ground quicker or comes to the ground quicker than the other? And in sitting, if you are not able to stand in sitting, maybe you can lift one foot and then lift the other. And you feel what it's like to lift one leg and stand on one foot and lift one and stand on the other. And then as you walk around, start to notice what happens with your arms and your shoulders. And the answer may be nothing, and that's fine. And it doesn't, I, I think the lesson's better done barefoot, Janet, but I don't want to uh, put too many constraints for people that are new. Sometimes barefoot's very scary for people. And then come to just stand for a moment or sit upright for a moment. And what's what's the ease in being upright? Does your head feel heavy? Do your shoulders feel heavy? Does your low back feel strange? It's what's, what have you got there? So this is our what we call a beginning scan. And we can use it to compare to later to get a sense of what may have changed during our, our session or time together. And then please do go ahead and come to the position that you would like to be in. Now, I'm a better teacher if I can see more of you. So if you're uncomfortable having your camera on you, that's great. I'm not going to record you. I'm not going to call you out, but it allows me to uh, realize when my instructions aren't as clear as they could be. And the people that you will get highlighted off and on for you and for the recording will be Pia and Marley. So come into that position that you're choosing to work with. And here, just take a moment to sort of scan through the sensation of yourself and your awareness of yourself in relationship to the surfaces. Now the surface, if you're lying down, is across the back of yourself, especially if you're lying with your legs long. If you're seated, then the surface has multi-dimensional, right? It's according to the bottom of it, the bottom of your feet, the bottom of your, your pelvis, but then across the back of your spine or shoulders. And regardless of the position, you may be able to sense, oh, hey, there's one leg or one foot that's got a different relationship with the surface than the other one does. Somehow one feels more heavy or pressing or lifted. And if you can, Kind of get a sense between left and right, what is the difference that you feel? And then come up to the pelvis. And for some of you, it will be the back of your pelvis. If you're on the floor, if you're sitting, it'll be the bottom of your pelvis. And here again, you might go, interesting. Well, I lean on my pelvis a little differently from one side to the other. I go more to the right, or I go more to the left, or the left is a little lifted or a little forward, or the right is a little forward and the left is pressed back. So which side of the pelvis do you tend to lean on more heavily? And does that go with the same shoulder which you felt was closer to the ground or further back in space? Or is it the opposite shoulder? It's curious if your relationship is more along the same side or along a diagonal where one shoulder is back or down, back and down, and one side of the pelvis is down. And then notice the space behind your low back and just 
be curious about whether there's a larger curve on the right side of the low back, an in curve, curve in towards the front of your body, or a little bit more on the left side, or are they just identically equal? And you don't need to fix anything. So as I'm calling out these things, many of us will start trying to adjust to fix it. And that's okay, but it's a very artificial way that can't be maintained over time. And we wanna to speak to the deeper nervous system about getting an inside out change through, uh, for lack of a better word, reprogramming of your postural habit. And then you might notice the curve behind your neck. And then the way that you're, the weight of your head. So in sitting, it's like the weight of your head as you sit there, does it feel light, heavy? But in line, it can be like, how hard is the head pressed back into the ground? Sometimes it really feels like you're drilling all your weight onto a spot. And other people will feel like their head is quite lifted. Now in the chair with your legs about pelvis width apart and your hands on your thighs, um, you'll find that your elbows are uh, auto automatically a little bit wider than your hands. So you don't really need to do anything other than have your legs about pelvis width apart, feet about pelvis width apart, and your hands resting on your thighs. On the ground, can you have your arms long beside you? And then just have your palms to your hands a little bit closer to your body than your elbows. Just a little bit closer to your body than your elbows. Now, some of you will find that one of your shoulders does not like this at all. And so there's a couple of options. You could support the shoulder that comes way off the ground by putting a small towel under that shoulder, or you could just back away from it until you are okay with that arm, that hand. We do wanna keep the hands on the ground, but a little bit closer than the elbows if it's, it's comfortable. It might be odd, might feel like eh, not my first choice, but we don't want it to be painful. But now, in that position, begin to notice your breath flowing in and out. Find what your normal rhythm of breath is like. And try to be dedicated to letting your breath be a barometer for how this lesson is going. So that if you start to find that your breath speeds up or that you hold it, it's probably an indication that something is not going well. And you are absolutely in charge of making this the most pleasurable movement experience you can have. As you follow your breath flowing in and out, begin to just ever so slightly bring that ball of the right shoulder joint, the right upper arm ball in the socket, bring that ball a little bit forward in space, forward in space, and then just let it come back to rest. And then again, when you're ready, you'll do it again. Now, very important is that you don't go forward, back, forward, back, forward, back. That becomes a very boring exercise. Instead, you wanna go forward and then slowly back and then take maybe a full breath cycle. You'd almost think, huh, does she expect me to stay all asleep while I'm doing this? Because it's pretty marginal, but we need this slowness in order to calm our nervous system. So it's available to learn something new. We also need the slowness so that we begin to be able to notice when we're doing something that doesn't feel great, maybe even hurts.
And as you do that movement, you might feel like, oh, yeah, yes, I'm moving that ball in the socket a little bit forward and then it catches my collarbone. And then when I lay it down, I don't push it down. I just lay it back to where it started. You may feel like, oh, that's nice. It's resting. And some of you may find that your head wants to do something. Like there's a little impulse that your nose or your head wants to roll one direction or the other. And you can let that happen. If it doesn't feel like the nose wants to do anything, that's fine too. And it doesn't want to roll at all, that's fine too. Okay. Let's let that go. Rest your arms so that they're not in that position for a few moments. And if you find that now you're thinking, I think maybe my legs are not so comfortable, you can put something under your knees if the legs are long, or you can rest with your feet in the standing position. That's okay too. And then when you're ready, come back to the same position where your hands are a little bit closer to the side of your body than your elbows. For those of you in sitting, it happens naturally. When you put your palms down on your thighs, for those of you lying down, you'll need to actually make that happen a little bit. A little something we wouldn't normally tend to do. Not very many of us will do that. And then come to feel and sense into the left ball in the socket of the upper arm bone. And let's find out what it's like here to slowly bring the left ball of the shoulder joint a little forward, the left ball of the upper arm a little forward, and then let it come back to the resting neutral position. Breath, remember, it's going on. Seamlessly, easy. It's a pause between. And a strange place of just letting it be before you start again. You can for sure make this movement quite big. And if you feel that impulse in yourself, I'd say, go ahead, do it big. And then see if you can make it half that size the next time. And then half that size. And then a quarter of that size. And you might begin to notice, oh, oh. It does feel a little nicer if I'm not constantly going the entire distance I first felt the impulse for. And then bring yourself there to rest for a moment. And let's begin to imagine this beam of light that connects through one interior aspect of the ball and socket of the shoulder joint to the other. This beam of light, it connects them. And when you're ready, begin to just bring both balls in the socket. Of course, the socket is coming with it, but we're thinking about the ball. We're thinking about the ball and small. And we just bring them both forward. Like we're, we're, we're rotating this imaginary shaft of light. And of course, that means both of the ball in the socket are, are not only coming a little forward, but they're probably, they're probably like looking down a little bit the pelvis. If there was an eyeball 
in each of those balls of the socket in the socket. It's like the eye would be looking a little tiny bit in the direction towards your feet or your pelvis. And then you let it go and you pause. And you may be beginning to notice that hey, it turns out that when I do movements, I coordinate it with my breath. Maybe you tend to bring away from the ground on the out breath. Maybe you tend to bring it away from the ground or the forward motion. Uh, if you're in the chair, it's a forward motion for both of the chair or ground really. In uh, On the in breath, see if you can observe what you're doing. And for sure, a few of us are holding our breath, holding our breath. So what are you doing? And then can you experiment with something that you aren't doing? So maybe you weren't coordinating at all. Very unlikely. Humans really like to coordinate these kinds of movements with their breath in some way. But you might be. Might have been somebody who wasn't doing it at all. But maybe you were oh, somebody was holding it. Maybe you were exhaling it. Maybe you were inhaling every time you brought them forward. And then you did the opposite when you brought them back to rest. Can you try something different? And what does it mean when you try something different? What does it mean to the quality of the movement? Maybe your first choice was the absolute best quality you could have or maybe it wasn't. And maybe now you'd like to try something else. And I saw somebody roll over on their side. Wonderful, it's wonderful when you take care of yourself and you take the breaks you need. If you get bored or agitated, it's important that you notice it. And then you ask yourself, what can I do for myself right now that might let me get more out of the lesson? if I took care of myself at this moment. Sometimes that's doing a little wiggle or just giving yourself some permission to create your own experience and still maybe stick with the basics of the lesson. You may also notice that when you bring the shoulders a little forward and then a little back, one of them lifts further than the other or comes off the ground quicker than the other. And that when you bring them back to the ground, one of them comes to the ground first. So could you make it small enough and slow enough that you will be able to time them the same amount and distance. They both come off at the same time. They only go so far. Whichever one goes the least distance, choose that one, partner with it, and then they both come back to the ground. And the quality that this has on the light beam, the quality of the light beam, the rolling of the light beam, the rotation of the light beam might be something interesting to wonder about. Your head may lean back, your chin may come away. If you feel like your head is being pulled from the ground though, like you need to lift it, do way, way less. Do it even in your imagination. That's good. Okay, let's let that go and let your arms rest. Let your legs rest. If you are in sitting and uh, it feels like you need another kind of rest, then just wiggle around in your chair or change your position a little bit. Let your eyes maybe be closed. That's okay for you. 
Let your attention wander. Now we're going to shift to those hip joints. We're going to shift down to those ball in the socket. But let's start with the right. And you can use your hand to put in your groin to be, if you can feel around, or even both hands, if you can feel around a little bit, where might that ball in the socket be? Where might it be? When the legs are long or bent, either one, you might find it very interesting to uh, be able to more feel now, oh, I can feel something about the architecture of that. I can feel something about the architecture of that. So you can feel the outside of your pelvis, but that's definitely not what we're talking about, is it? We're talking about that place right close to the pubic bone. Do you remember where it was? It was like the pubic bone. If you find your edges of your pubic bone here in line, and then you come out to the outside edges of it, and then you just go a little further into the crease of where your leg joins your torso, where if you wear old-fashioned underwear, like I wear your underwear line, not if you wear thongs, say long thong underwear, but your underwear line, it's in there. It's in there, deep in the interior. It's not out of the sides. It's not on those bony sides. You won't be able to feel the bone of it. Now, lying on the ground, legs long, please. Legs long, lie on the ground, unless you need to have them standing. So let your imagination come to that right ball in the socket and just tilt that right ball a little bit up, tip it somehow a little up. It won't be a pure up. It'll be a little diagonal probably, no worries. Just see what would it be like to sort of tilt it up from the ball, thinking about the ball, not so much the buttock and not so much like you gotta get the whole pelvis off the ground, just, just a tiny little tilt there, tiny little tilt. And of course you lower and you come back to neutral. This is a little more difficult. You may find yourself straining a little bit more, wanting to hold your breath, wanting to sort of uh, grab. If you can just be ever so gentle. You could even imagine someone has a string tied to the ball and they're just helping you by just pulling the string and it just brings the ball a little bit. Up. Now the nature of this is going to be, I think, for all of you, is to go a little in the direction of the left shoulder joint. I think it's just the way that your body is set up. If you're sitting in a chair, it won't be lifting your heel. Huh. You're lifting your heel will hide the ball in the socket. It won't tilt the ball in the socket upwards. It'll tilt it backwards. It has to be something different than lifting your heel something to puzzle out. It's very subtle. Okay, let's let that go. Let's go over to your left ball and socket. If you haven't already used your hands to feel around there a little bit and to be curious about where it is, do that now. Kind of go, I wonder what it is. What is, now that I'm here, that doesn't seem very clear at all, maybe. <clears throat> And then once you feel like you maybe have an idea of where it is, begin to tilt your left ball in the socket a little bit up, like as in towards your face, or maybe it feels more natural to go towards the right shoulder. What, what is easy for you? And then you place it back in the neutral position. Let that go for a moment. Let's connect those two balls in the socket <clears throat> with this imaginary light beam, right? This imaginary light beam. So now you're gonna tilt both of them in the up direction. 
both of them in the up direction. And what effect does that have on that beam of light? And what effect does it have on your low back? What effect does it have on the balls and the sockets of the shoulder? They may not be holding still during this. They may feel, oh, I need to do something here. I, I got to try something out here. I got to respond to that call. There's a very deep call and response to <clears throat> call and response to the um, motion of the pelvis in the shoulders. And then let's pause with that. Come to your right arm, ball, and socket. The humerus, the ball of the humerus. And begin to take it a little bit forward in space as if it wants to go in the direction of the left hip joint, the left ball and socket. So it's just the right shoulder. I'm sorry, let's bring those hands a little closer to the side of your body again. So the elbows are a little further out and the hands are on the ground, if possible. And then place it back down. And this time when you place it down, press a little bit, press. So it's not a lot of press, it's not a lot of lift. You curl it off the ground a bit and it maybe looks as if there was an eyeball there in the front of the ball of the shoulder joint. It could look in the direction of the left hip joint. Like it wants to see in that direction. It's not going to see, but it wants to, wants to take a peek. And then you put it down. And when you put it down or back, it's looking straight forward in space. And you're putting it a little bit of a pressure back towards the chair or towards the ground. Now pause with that and feel your left ball in socket and begin to tilt it a little in the direction of the right shoulder joint. Right ball in socket, like it wants to look there. And when you put it down, think of putting the ball down and rolling that ball in the hip joint a little bit back towards the floor, towards the chair behind you. And begin to imagine this horiz this diagonal light beam that connects these two, right? There's a diagonal light beam. So let's let's make it a little more obvious. Take the left shoulder joint and the right hip joint. Right, we were doing were we doing the right? We were doing the right. Take the right and the left and imagine that diagonal light beam. And now Fold both of those balls towards each other and then roll them both a little away from each other. Now, for some of you, this will feel like, oh, I love it. Others of you will be like, ooh, that doesn't feel quite right in my pelvis. So you just could do it in your imagination and it will make a difference. So you're shortening the light beam really as you bring them towards each other. And then you're lengthening the light beam as you take them away from each other. Those of you who are on the ground, you still have your elbows maybe a little wider than your palms. Your palms are down. Good. 
breathing easy. You're feeling, starting to feel now like, oh, when I bring these two light beams towards each other, these two balls towards each other, the light beam bends and goes back in space somewhere in the middle of my cell. Where is that middle of the cell? Let's try the other diagonal. Let's come to the other shoulder, the other opposite hip. <clears throat> and gradually, I, and I want to just say, I just love that Marlena has got a little something going on with her right arm. And she's one of our models and she's been patting underneath her hand or her arm. So there's even our models are taking care of themselves. I hope that you're taking care of yourself. Yeah, it's perfect. I love it. And so as you go to this other diagonal, just take your time again to monitor your breath. Let the breath flow out, let the breath flow in. Begin to fold this other diagonal. Lift, fold inward, roll the balls in the socket inward towards like they wanna see each other. And that doesn't mean that you have to make a giant movement. You can make the movement the size that you want, but it doesn't need to be giant. And often we say the movements can be very, very small, even in your imagination to get a lot of power out of them. So it's totally fine. Whatever size you choose, as long as it doesn't feel compulsive, like you have no choice, then you want to kind of tease around with yourself a little bit and go, hmm, could I do a different size of movement? Would that be okay with me? Or is this really, I've only got one choice. Because one choice is a trap, always a trap. And then remember that we're also taking them a little back in space. So they fold towards each other and then they go back in space. They fold towards each other and they go back in space. And pause with that. Let's take a rest with your hands, your arms, your mind. So, for us, rest times are vital. They allow you to come back even after just a few seconds to a, with a fresh perspective. They allow you to notice what's changing, right? You're, you're really changing in relationship to the surface and the floor now, aren't you? All along, lots of changes happening. And hopefully you are not feeling like, oh, I'm really overworking my neck, my jaw. Just let, as you rest here, just let the weight of your tongue hang back in your mouth. Let the weight of your jaw, let the weight of your ears, let the weight of your eyes release to gravity. And then let's come back to the position that we've been working with. Let's do just a couple movements of bringing the right balls and sockets, the right humerus ball, the right shoulder ball, and the right hip joint a little towards each other and a little away. So now we're doing a, a vertical sort of line down the side of the body. Mm -hmm. breath is easy and you push back a little bit in space and then you come towards and you push back and then let's come to that other side let that side go and come to your left or whatever whatever side you weren't doing and the same side, the left ball and socket of the hip and the shoulder coming a little towards each other, folding towards a little away, folding towards a little away. Easy, easy. The breath seems like it facilitates it. There's no fighting between the breath and the movement. Softness in the ribs. If you have been having trouble with your neck and your jaw, start sticking your tongue out. 
just like ever so small, small, just as you do the movement, kind of go, this is your tongue, kind of stick out just a little bit, like, a, like as if you get a really fat, lax tongue. And then you just let it come back into your mouth. It's a way to sort of maybe get around some of that neck and jaw habit you might have. Good. And then let's pause for a moment and let's do one diagonal and the other. We'll alternate diagonal. So take, say, the right shoulder, left hip joint, bring them towards, and then away and back in space a little bit. And then the other diagonal towards and away and back in space a little bit. And then start to follow the light beam that connects each of these balls and sockets and how the light beams are sliding across each other, aren't they? One light beam is getting shorter, longer, and then the other one's getting shorter, longer. And where they intersect is sliding. It's a sliding point. What if you do all four corners at the same time coming towards the light beams all coming towards the center a little bit, and then the light beams all going away from the center. And you start to have this image of how the breath facilitates this movement, not just from the ball in the sockets, but in the center where the light beams cross forward and back, open and close, breath in, breath out. And then can you begin to feel how those light beams are extending out into another one of those bodies on that grid, those light grid from Alex Gray's um, picture that I showed. Can you imagine that? And then how we are all connected here as our corners fold in and our corners fold out. And the light is shimmering, moving, undulating, really around the world. And then let that go. Just take a last moment to really feel and sense, hmm, here I am now on the surface. Rest your arms so that they're comfortable. Here I am now on the surface. And I can imagine myself connected to the people here in the session and you know, who knows what time is, but probably those people who do it on replay were probably all doing it at the same time. Who knows what this whole parallel universe time thing is about. It gets more and more complicated all the time because of in our ability to understand. So that there's a rhythm, a breath, a movement, an undulation that carries from us through to others. And the quality of our movement for ourselves is a quality we offer to the world. And the quality that the world is moving is something that's offered to us. And when you're ready, please allow yourself to slowly make your way up to standing. And then when you come up to stand, there's no hurry. So I'm only going to say this for the people who are really quick at it. <laughs> Just stand. Don't, don't move right away. Just stand. If you need to stay in a chair, maybe you could sit 
at the front of your chair unsupported for a bit. Just stand without really needing to walk yet. And let the, the sensation of this grid, these, these lines that you've got connecting both shoulders, both hip, uh, hip bones, both hip joints, both shoulder joints, the shoulder joint to the hip joint on each side, the, the diagonal of it. Can you let that come up with you into gravity so that you have a sense of this dimensional center where it crosses and the way that it extends outward? And then I said it was going to help with walking. Let's see if I'm right. Go ahead and start taking it into walking. Find out. Huh. What is it now that makes walking maybe simpler? It could make it harder. But many of you, I think, will find that it makes it simpler. Because what we were doing on the floor was a walking lesson, for sure. It was a walking lesson. Early baby movement. Early baby movement to get ready for walking before the child, the baby has any concept of what being upright might even, not even, it's not even a dream for them yet. It's not even a dream. All they're learning is how to lift and press. These really powerful shoulder and hip joints. And coordinate them in a variety of different patterns that make standing easier. At five, six minutes over. I'm sorry about that. I'm here available to take questions and answers and comments. I'd like to encourage you, though, to walk around for at least like 30 more seconds at different speeds, not come back to looking at a computer right away. I'll just be hanging out here. I'm ready to chit chat with anybody who'd like to chit chat with me. The setup was a little long for this lesson because I really want to give new people their best chance of success. Um, and so a lot to communicate about this style of work. And, uh, and, and that communication of those, that setup is, is vital to you getting the most of what you can get without getting into any injury or strain. Okay. So my heart says amazingly profound. Thanks so much. Very healing. Mm. Hel Hel uh, Helena, easier, smoother, lighter walking. I see that Rebecca, you have a question. You want to hear your, uh, we're going to hear your voice. We're not going to see your picture, Rebecca. So go ahead. I'm going to ask you to unmute. You can make it. Hi there. Hi. I, I can see you. We just don't have your your face on the recording. So go ahead. So my question is, how do you respond when people say um, this hurts or, oh, I'm getting some tension in the side of my neck when I do that? Um, how is this supposed to feel? What are some of your like common responses when people are, you know, have varying reactions to this stuff? Mm -hmm. Are you a teacher? I am a personal trainer and a massage therapist. I just okay. took Joanne and Paul's MMIA course. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, just it just helps me to kind of know what um, you know what language what shared language we might have or not have. Um, well, the the first thing is if I'm not teaching online, I'm teaching in person. I'm usually can tell when people are really struggling. So um, I will often go by and, and, and offer like a support to somebody. Like, could I, would you like a little something under your head? Would you like to try it? I almost always say, try it. If you don't like it, get rid of it. Because it's, I don't want to override people's authority, right? About what it is that they know about themselves. I don't want to 
get them focused on me as the expert of their body. I want to see if I can keep putting that ball back in their court because they're going to live most of their day without me. And, and that's a good thing. Believe me, <laughs> that's a good thing. Um, so I want to keep putting them, them. I can, can you put your hand back up? Cause I love seeing your face while I'm talking to you and you disappear on me when you, uh, when you took your hand down. So I want to be able to, to know I'm talking to you. Yeah. Thank you, dear. Um, so I'm kind of trying to put that ball back in their court all the time. Uh, and still leave them in very much in charge. If I really think somebody is doing something that actually is hurting themselves in some way that concerns me, of course, I'm going to say something, but I'm mostly usually seeing things that look to me like, man, that could be like a strain. I wonder if I just helped them put a little something under their shoulder. Or if I just said, Hey, you don't have to bend your arm in quite so far. Um, or even just have your arm straight for now and see what it's like for you. That, that little things like that can make a big difference. I can also ask uh, ahead of time, you know, uh, how are you doing with that? But then if they say, you know, I'm having, um, I'm having pain, I'm having discomfort, then in this one, I didn't, I really, I, I could have made this out less, less, less than another hour, to be honest. I would have done a whole bunch more with the tongue. And uh, that would have started, I think, really changing some of the people who are getting like neck strain from it. And they're getting some weirdness. So that the tongue just kind of goes every time a shoulder comes forward, the tongue goes. Now, some certainly somebody could go, they could do that, you know? So then I'm always saying, can you do less? Can you do, you heard me say half that amount, one quarter that amount, one eighth that amount. You give them some gradation ideas that seem really bizarre. Now, some people will um, uh, still do the same amount, but they'll slow it down. Like they, they don't know the difference between speed in their body and distance or effort yet. So these are all things that we're doing in the Feldenkrais approach, which is just to try to help people begin to realize the range of options available to them. I would also say do it in your imagination only for five or so movements. And if that still hurts in the imagination, it's probably not for you today. And that's okay. It'll be for you another time. Does that make sense? So those are some options. Yeah, thank you for that. I really appreciate that. It was a great question. Um, so uh, I'm going to take Trisha from the comments and then I'm going to grab Janet. So Trisha, do you have any comment on how the ball of the bone seems hard to move or is it? Um, I think that the, the way that I taught it is not the traditional way that there were several things that were not the traditional way that this lesson is taught. So I'm really into helping people find the balls in their sockets right now, have been for about the last three or four years. I think it makes a big difference in uh, low back uh, uh, and shoulder pain in the long run as they're able to articulate that. So I don't know if I was a newbie, if I would find that really a hard image, but you don't need to separate the ball from the bone. I'm only, and maybe I did not make this clear enough. I'm only suggesting that you initiate the movement with the ball in mind, as opposed to the shoulder. Normally it's just taught talking about the shoulder. The shoulder is big. And I'd like to see if I could get people a little more aware of something even closer to their proximal self instead of their distal self. So it's not that you need to move with these two movements, the ball separate from the, the socket, it's that the ball is, is what you're thinking about as the leader sort of of the movement. I hope that helps and that might make it so not so hard. Janet, go ahead. Did I unmute you? No, I did not. Let me try that again. Got to, I gotta know how to use my equipment. Great, thank you. Um, did Moshe Feldenkrais, did, did he understand or was he coming from understanding fascia 
And I'm thinking of uh, Joanne Aberson and John Sharkey, who are now brought the concept to me of the fascia being one big piece of fabric that origami, we origami ourselves into being. So I was curious about his his view, like how did he come to this understanding? Well, when Moshe was uh, created, over the decades in which he created his work, sort of the pinnacle of his work was also the pinnacle of Ida Roth's work. So she was a structural integration person who was probably one of the mm -hmm. first people really codifying a way of working with soft tissue and fascia, even though we didn't know hardly anything about fascia then, right? With almost nothing was really understood or known from a research point of view. Anything that was known about it was known mm -hmm. from the felt sense of the practitioner, mm -hmm. right? Um, so Feldenkrais did not focus on fascia. What was it? What was his understanding? He understood that the whole human being was connected. So there's there's the there's our connection point right there for you, Janet. He really got that it was all connected, but he tended to focus on the skeletal system because he felt that um, too many people were excessively using their muscular system. We'd gotten so into exercise protocols already by then that we were excessively using the muscular system to try to do things that the bony structure was designed to do. And that if we could help people come back and notice their skeletal structure, the muscular system, and I would say the fascial system starts to reorganize itself. So it doesn't have to try so hard. Now, all this information about all the nerve receptors and sensors in the fascia, we knew nothing about then, of course. That the science was like almost non-existent. There was there was still mostly discussions about fascia and count, right? At, at that point, we're talking about uh, them dying. Them, I don't know what year Ida died, but Moshe died in 73 or four. No, 84, it's 84. So, I mean, all that research has really gone wild in the last 20 years. A lot of it, even just in the last 10. Um, so I have no doubt that he would be very respectful of the fascist role within the system because we, we were always seeing it as a fluid system, a system that uh, is communicating within itself all the time. And that anywhere that we can reduce the amount of effort and make the motor coordination cleaner so that it is smooth and gliding and that everything is going together instead of, you know, it's more jerky sort of abrasive kind of movements, which do then start to cause us to tense everywhere else. So I would say fascia is not the Feldenkrais thing, but I would think that all Feldenkrais practitioners by this point have a, a good appreciation and respect for what the fascia is doing for us. And we for sure know that when we emphasize the brain or we emphasize the most, the Thank you. bony system, we know that we're still working with everything else. Also, I just wanna say one more thing about that, which was um, muscles go like every which direction. So Feldenkrais was very adamant that we would not focus on muscles and try to get everybody to understand every little muscle and what every little muscle was doing. He said, if you're going to get people to focus on something, let's get them focus on something that they can actually follow pretty in a pretty clear manner because the bony structure is not as complicated. So it gave, gives them a way of knowing their body from something that um, it, it, it's easy to follow and even translate from your felt sense to pictures and back and forth. So that was the other piece of that, Janet. Thank you for the question. Uh, let me take one from the comments and then I'm going to get here. Love, love some of the results you had. You're allowed to have negative results too. So feel free to, um, comment on that. Okay. It doesn't look like I missed anything yet. Okay. Karen. Uh, there you go. Sorry. 
I'm a little rusty on asking people to unmute. That's okay. Yeah, I was trying. You cut your hair. Anyway, um, <laughs> anyway, um, thank you for this. Um, I think it's tricky to explain it and demonstrate. I mean, like, so um, Katrina was very helpful. Like, first of all, so the skeleton was helpful to have you to see the skeleton. So appreciate that. But I think it's hard to like explain it on Zoom. Like I was trying, to, I was lying down. So I was trying to follow what, what um, Mariana Mariana was doing, but if I'm lying down, I can't look at what she's doing, right? So I'm listening to you. So it's a little bit of a conundrum of how to orchestrate this because I know it can't be in person. So that's, I don't know. I don't have an answer to that. I'm just explaining that it was a little challenging. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, Karen, I would say that we never used to use models and we've only just started using them because of the cultural addiction to watching someone else do something. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it, we were actually very adamantly against it. Now in a live session, people do peek at what other people are doing. They still might have to sit up to do that, but they right. will peek at what other people are doing, yeah. but it is a fundamental aspect of the Feldenkrais work is for, to let people struggle around with the instruction and their body and that just like a baby would have it, right okay. a baby is like struggling around going what's this thing that's great i didn't know that i could hear that okay 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 now i can't even figure out how to move it again and they start all over with the process it's a little less cumbersome this time now they go oh, oh. <laughs> You know, and then, oh, what's that? So we're trying to take you back to, hey, what is this thing? Without all my other preconceived ideas, okay, with weird wording that we're doing as we teach verbally to you, we're trying to take you out of that tendency that just come. As soon as we are up walking around and we're going around putting our fingers in our pants, trying to stand like our dad or our hands in their pockets and the, down around the hips or the little girl trying to dress like their mommy in some way. It's normal for us to imitate, impersonate and use that as part of our education. But when you have a culture that does not movement-based, it's not sensually movement-based, it becomes the substitute of me now kind of riffing off on something. So the would say this is what other Feldenkrais people might say, but it becomes a substitute for the actual felt internal experience and the self-discovery. So okay. sometimes we say that Feldenkrais is really complicated, the Feldenkrais method, but I think it's really simple. It's the simple process that you were born with and have forgotten that you were born with it. It's a simple process of experimentation sensation result experimentation sensation result experimentation sensation result i uh you know slap something really loud and everybody goes oh don't do that no we don't we don't bang the spoons i'll take the spoon away from you right okay what's that mean after a while, I really realized I'm not allowed to bang spoons. And there are other movements that we start to be told not to do, right? And there's ways that we're taught to sit in the chairs. And all those schools are trying to get better. This still, it's a lot of sitting. No PE, no creative arts in most in American schools. That is gone unless you're in a charter school of some kind. It is gone. They are just educating to pass tests, educating to pass tests. You don't read books to the kids. I mean, I've been talking to teachers about this, so I'm not making it up. Um, so we're really trying to take you back in this very weird, instructive way to, oh, experimentation, sensation, result according to what I think, not a result yeah. according to what Cynthia thinks. Right. The reason according to what I think, was that a successful movement for me? And a baby would have judged it by 
two ways. It felt good and it got me something I wanted. <laughs> Babies are not purposefully going to do something that hurts. A puppy does not do something purposefully that hurts. And, you know, Darby, my little, my little Thai guy, um, who's not down here today because he doesn't come to me with the basement anymore because he now realizes I work a lot. <laughs> it's like, what do you need more? I'm down there. <laughs> no, for, no fun for Darby. But see, there's right there. He's not going to do it. He's like, it's no fun for me down here. It's not really a great place to rest. And you're going to want me to be quiet. And I'll just stay up here where I can hop on any surface I want and go out the back door and blah, blah, blah. So, of course, we have to behave as adults. We sure do, don't we? Uh, <laughs> And there's societal rules, but this coming home to ourselves, it's a, it's tricky business. And there's another piece then in there, Karen, which is we're trying to guide people out of the habit, not just the habit of performing and doing, but the deep movement happened that movement habit that formed the time that I banged something on the table and everybody yelled. And I went, <gasps> okay. loud noises, not good. I think I did that. I had too much power, whatever my little system did with it. So we're trying to help people find their way back to a movement that is safe for them without, without being judged from the outside by the teacher or anybody else in the room with any well, love. Thank yeah. Thank you for explaining. Yeah. Cause I didn't realize that. And it, in some ways it's somewhat almost like a rebirthing kind of thing, but yeah. It is kind of. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Karen. What's your background? I'm just a person. <laughs> I'm just a person. <laughs> I'm just a person living life. I'm a Karen Axelrod, unique to me. That's great. Well, it's a, such a deep question. I, I just wanted to, I thought maybe you might have had a background. In it. That's a good question. I mean, I'm a very kinesthetic person. I Movement is important to me, but I don't, I, I guess I just want to understand. I like to understand. Sure. <laughs> That's what this, that's absolutely. I think it's great to want to understand. And I think that's part of the original thing, right? The original why. It, what do we do by the time we're two? Why, 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 why? There's nothing wrong with asking why. We may not be able to answer it, but there's nothing wrong with it. It's, it's healthy. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm more willing to buy in if I understand why. <laughs> it's my New York upbringing. What can I say? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right, thank you. Yeah, great. Uh, Tasha? Oh, I'm sorry. I did not unmute you again. I'm like, I got, I got to get a lesson in unmuting, Tasha. I think that's. I'm gonna try it one more time there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, right. Um. Yeah. So I, I was lying on my back, and um, I loved the little subtle movements, and I was getting this kind of a cross, diagonal cross across my chest, um, and and across my back. Um, I, I have a, a scoliosis that was never very bad until six years ago and suddenly it went like that. And um, so I was really focusing on that. And um, I just wondered if this is something that is used much for scoliosis, uh, because my feeling about it, um, I'm, I'm, I'm come from classical ballet, um, is that if it moved to get worse, surely it could move to get back um does it yeah that's nice that's nice yeah, I think no. really helpful attitude to have um so yes people do with scoliosis do use the feldenkrais work quite a lot successfully yes and but i'm gonna i'm gonna define what success uh, means perhaps tasha in a different way right. um so first, I want to say something about when you have scoliosis, a more significant one, which tends to happen like you might get more significant as we age, right? Uh, like mm -hmm. we didn't notice it so much in our 20s and 30s and 40s, but then now 50s, 60s, 70s, it can start to become very noticeable if it's idiot idiopathic scoliosis in particular. But even functional scoliosis, which comes from how we use ourselves. Uh, becomes more noticeable typically as we age. And the reason for both of them is because we do more of what we already knew how to do better, which means it may be a dysfunctional movement pattern, but we do more of it. And so the brain's plasticity, this 
makes us better at it. Um, so there is two elements to uh, idiopathic scoliosis, the type that is usually diagnosed when a, a young adult, not from an injury or a young uh, teen, adolescent. There's the actual impulse in the system that's creating, and we don't know exactly why, Feldenkrais thought it might have been neurological, this impulse in the system to create this additional twisting in the spine that's not normally present. There's that. And then there is the functional piece of how we use that spine throughout our life, which usually most of us, almost everybody, now sometimes dancers have a... Um, leg up on this from other people, but not always, um, means that what the easiest pattern of movement available to us is the one that we'll use over and over and over again. That's that's the way we're built is, is uh, just like a river is going, water is gonna flow through the areas that are the most easily channeled out already. It doesn't choose to go uphill. It doesn't choose to go around and up and over in a corner. And when you want to build a new mo movement habit or something that doesn't follow the typical scoliosis or curvature of the spine, even if it's not a scoliosis, let's say you have a tendency to have a really strong in curve in your low back, it will be a process of moving against the long grooved in pattern of the water. So it's not simple. Usually it's not simple to do on your own because it's not easy to even notice what it is you're doing. So we have those, both of those elements. Now, as we age with scoliosis, we, so this, these are some terms that if you're not, if you're not somebody who has idiopathic scoliosis, so you don't work with this, these might be uncomfortable terms, but they're the best terms that I've heard, which is there's usually gonna be a rib hump, an area that protrudes back, right? On um, one or more of those for the person. And in the younger years, this can be fairly malleable. Um, so the younger a person starts working with this kind of method, I believe the more benefit they get for the rest of their life. It's also one which does not, um, ask the person to move in pain patterns. And so it's not as bad as it used to be, but I mean, I remember a, a young woman who came to me, uh, she was maybe maybe 30 um, and was and just said, I'm scared to lie on your table because every time I've ever lied on a table through my childhood, they hurt me trying to fix my scoliosis, right? So there's people that have been really hurt in therapies around, psychologically and physically hurt, if you, can, if you can even separate those two things out around the approach to scoliosis. And then there's also the feeling that you're somehow not right, that other people might see you not, as not right, or people might comment, oh, you walk a little this way or that way. I mean, there's all these things going on, right? Now, as a person goes grows older though, the, that the bony structure that tends to lean out leans out more and more and it calcifies. You are not gonna change calcifications. Okay. okay. That's not gonna be changed. That does not mean that you can't change some of the curvature of the twisting. If you keep, I don't think you'll change it permanently. I think you'll have to keep playing with it with these kinds of approaches so that you go in and out of it and you learn enough about your pattern that you don't go into the easy part of the pattern all the time, but that you start to challenge yourself to go a little bit in the directions that don't come natural, right? Not with force, but that don't come natural. And then you have to have some ways of putting movement through that pattern. I also think you have to have ways of strengthening your pelvic floor and your diaphragm and your abdominal muscles because they have been asymmetrically developed, right? So one side has really got a lot of room for the diaphragm to go down in and the pelvic floor to expand in and the other side hardly has any, 
usually. So I think you have to have some ways to also work with strengthening around it. However, having said all that, I hear over and over and over from people that they that have scoliosis, that they love the work. But I do think it's not a complete package for what people will need um, unless you really find a practitioner who's going to specialize in developing a program just for people with scoliosis. There's going to need to be more in there. And it could very well. It's like one of my, you know, one of my fantasies in my lifetime would be a program for people with scoliosis. Wow. It turns okay. out that my age and the number of hours in the day and all of that might not make that possible. But somebody else out there listening should think about it because I think it's a huge, huge need and and people want help. Yeah, um, and there isn't anything really. But I think this work in combination with yoga and breath work, I think, well, well just from the little bit that I just did, because I've already do lots of breath and yoga work mm -hmm. and I've been trying to work on my own with it but as you said I, I can't see it um but I think it would be really lovely like in as a combination to, to to support other other works absolutely absolutely and I know one of my original students names uh Cindy is here and she might be happy to say something in the comments or she might be happy to say something if you yeah. are raise your hand Cindy but um, she's somebody that has talked a lot in public forums about her experience with scoliosis in this work. You want to do it in the comments, Cindy, or verbally? I'm going to ask you to unmute. If you want to unmute, go ahead and unmute. And you could say something. So this might be help, more helpful to hear from somebody that has had the experience. I did reply to Tasha in the, in the chat. I'm replying to lots of people in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and find but, it but i have um idiopathic lumbar scoliosis adolescent onset i have a 50 degree curve and i think it makes me cry to say it but i think cynthia and this work has changed my life honestly and wow. she she knows that um it, I move more carefully. I can move way better than I could when I started this work 20 years ago. And it's it's just been um, very good for me um, in many, many ways. Um, and uh, so I'm a big fan and it's very much helped me. If you look at me, you can't even tell that I have a 50 degree curve. Doctors are constantly amazed when they see my x-ray. Um, and I can move very well for a person who's been dealing with this for 50 years. So. Oh, thank you for sharing that. That's beautiful. It was, wasn't it? It's a very sweet thing for her to do that for us. Yeah. And, um, and I feel that, Cindy, and you know I love you. <laughs> Oh, well, mine's 40 degrees. But, um, so it's really encouraging to, to hear your story. Uh, and as I thought, just and Cindy that. also does other things. She does other things. She's not somebody who lets any grass grow under her feet to help her health. So she's uh, she's not saying, although she made it, she's right there. It's that kind of like she, you know, she was given credit to all of Feldenkrais and me, but I know she gets credit to other things too, that she does do other things. So. Uh, I, I want to say I don't like she's she's been an, she's been an advocate for herself that's what I want to say and so I hear that from you you want to be an advocate for yourself and I think there are options for doing that for most people there's options for being an advocate for yourself yeah yeah good thank you uh, before I take any other questions or comments, I just want to say that if you have not signed up for the summit, sign up for the summit. Um, there, we can put the link in the chat for you. And if you're listening to this on replay, you could just go to FeldenkraisSummit.com and get signed up. It starts on Saturday. There'll be an opening party on uh, Friday, opening party ceremony, trying to understand what we're going to be experiencing together. 
The movement lessons this year will, I'll talk about this on Friday, but there are little movement explorations built into the talks. Um, although there's a really nice second lesson, I consider this to be kind of the first lesson of the summit, to be honest. There's a nice second lesson that'll be coming from my original teacher, uh, Julie Casson Rubin, um, uh, will be the second session. And I cannot say enough about Julie's teaching, incredible. And then, um, and then if you want more movement, you might consider doing the upgrade to the Unlimited Freedom Bundle. Lavinia Plonka and I will be teaching um, on the first four days, one of us will be teaching a nightly lesson, which you can do on replay. And we'll be we're calling them the secret sauce. They're secret thoughts, though they are happening live during the summit. They're secret. They're only available to the people who have upgraded. So think, think about signing up for the secret sauce lessons. Great, Jackie, glad to hear that. And um, uh, yeah, good. Anybody else want to say anything, ask anything? I love the comments, beautiful comments. Beautiful comments. And I hear, I hear also some of your like frustration, but then felt better even so getting up, uh, walking around. So yeah, good. You've got another hand up, Cynthia. I just, oh, I'm missing it. Okay, Barbara. Well, Barbara. Hello, Barbara. Hello, thank you, Cynthia, lovely lesson. I wanna add one thing about scoliosis. I did put something in the chat. Um, what you said about the baby experimenting and discovering and then having a result, sensing and having a result. And also about when one has scoliosis, you know something is wrong. I spent 40 odd years knowing something was wrong and it wasn't until I found Feldenkrais that I learned enough to figure out what was wrong, right? And when something goes wrong, I have a strategy for doing the experiment, for noticing what I feel. In other words, I, I re-engineered myself, you might say. But you have to, if you do enough, you start to figure out, oh, that's what's wrong. I always stand like this, or that's what's wrong. I'm doing something funny with my eyes, which is part of my scoliosis, you know? So I just want to say that the more you do it, the more you become able to figure out what it is that makes you feel off. And then you start to feel empowered and you start to feel grounded and grateful that you have a body after all. <laughs> Thank you. That's beautiful. Somebody asked a question in the first picture that I showed, do the diagonal lines cross with the belly button? I mean, that's a danger of me trying to draw a picture. And the answer is no, they rarely cross with the belly button. We would actually want them to cross higher because we want to, we want to get the counter rotation between the upper ribs and the lower ribs. We don't want the twist to be happening anywhere close to the low back. So when you are walking, you're starting to feel this cross pattern. When you're walking improved, it's because the cross pattern of what a shoulder girdle, these upper ribs coming forward and back started to improve and the opposite pattern of the pelvis and lower ribs. So we don't want, that's, that's a counter rotation uh, that happens in the spine, distributed throughout the spine. We don't want that to be in the low back. And so when you get down around the belly button, you're starting to get close to the low back. We want it to be a little bit higher than that, a little bit higher than that. But it's going to be different on different people. And whatever you felt is fine. You shouldn't try to make something happen in that lesson about where it crosses. Take what I said with a grain of salt. It's just kind of forward pacing you to where you might go somewhere down the line with it, but do not try to make or control the crossing of those lines in your experience. It's okay wherever they cross. For now, it is okay. And it will just keep changing according to how you uh, keep improving and learning. Uh, I'm glad to have you back, Beth, after a, a break. Okay, much love to you all. I hope to see you at the opening party on Friday. Thank you, Pia. Thank you, Marlena. And uh, yeah, see you. Bring bubbles, bring confetti, you know, bring your party pants, a party hat, a party tie. Bring something festive that you could throw in the air paper, shredded, whatever, so we get together. Okay, bye-bye.